know, I know, I know you, I think you can do this. All right. As long as I have stuff to read. I... <laughs> okay. okay well, this is our first online meeting of the year in January. Um, we were having, I think our last meeting um, last year face-to-face -face was in February. And then um, we, we ended up in, um, and I guess in May, we finally, we decided to go online and start getting involved with Zoom. Um, we're meeting, we're, so after this meeting, our next scheduled meeting will be March 11th. So that's the second Thursday of the month. And right now we're dark in April and then the meeting after that would be May. And I think it's May 13th, um, not May 8th. So March and uh, May will be our next two meetings. And our May meeting with May 13th, again, is um, Carl Cleary from um, from Searles Valley Mining Corporation, and he is going to he's going to speak on um, sodium carbonate essential for life. As you know, the Searles Lake has um, produces soda ash, boron, borax, boric acid, uh, sodium sulfate, and salt. So he's a chemical engineer and um, the property from moving along for, it seems like forever, it seems. It used to be Kermagee, the North American Chemicals, and um, IMC Global, and then more recently it was purchased by an Indian company, Nirma, which is based in Gujarat. But they, they're keeping it alive, so more power to them. There will be dark June, July, and August, uh, and then start up again in September. So. We're thinking of having a September meeting and November meeting, not a December meeting. And if we're going to have a field trip, we would schedule for October. So a lot of that depends on um, whether we can get people together in a bus that uh, enough people have been vaccinated, uh, you know, all those things. But until further notice, all our meetings are going to be on. Yeah, I, I just want to let you, yeah, there you go. I was going to say you don't need to use that slide to introduce the speaker because there's a couple other slides here. So go ahead. Well, as you can see, um, chairman is uh, Todd Ryrie. Uh, Dan Paolo from Bar Engineering is vice chairman and membership. Nicolette Grill, treasurer. I'm doing program chair. But we really, it's really become quite. Um, a communal group. We just all take um, as things are required. We do it. The other person who's been real key in this is Gene Dilley, who provides um, speakers, um, general guidance, and so all around good cheer. Uh, if you, we're look, we're always looking for speakers. Um, so particularly, we don't have anyone from March yet. So if you would like to volunteer, or if you have any thoughts, feel free to email me. Uh, this is a list of our past. Yeah, on, on that prior slide, I did put a note about the website. Okay, so the um, right we had the the Southern California, the SME hosts um, the regional website. So there's a SoCal website, and um, I haven't looked at it recently, but um, there is information on that. So there's the um, URL for it. Okay, well, our speaker, we're, we're really fortunate to have Karen, is it Coward or Kaywood? Um, speaking, um, and let me put up your bio again. I'll, I'll basically just gonna read it. She's a geologist specialized in hydrothermal ore deposits and structural deformation. Uh, currently a PhD at USC. And that must be, um, be curious to hear how that works with um, it all. You know, it was mostly um, 
virtual or whether you get to go into saw rocks and stuff like that. But it's structural geologists working on finding of gold mineralization. And um, South African moved here, uh, but sounds like has a, you have a fair bit of base metal and um, just ore genesis, ZX type deposits. So fairly varied background, um, mostly practical. And um, looks like you've, you've consulted and done work for a number of companies. Anyway, you probably can talk about yourself better than I can. So, um, Karen, um, it's all yours. Cool. Well, thank you very much, uh, Todd and Alan, for the introduction. Uh, sorry for the technological glitches. Apparently, stopping slideshows is easier than unmuting myself. Um, great, but thank you everyone for inviting me here today. Within a moment, I will have figured out how to share this screen. There we go. And uh, yeah, sit back, relax, enjoy your glass of wine or beer or water of choice. And uh, please don't ask too many difficult questions. Um, and with that, um, I will have time for questions at the end. But if anyone has a question in the meantime, feel free to unmute yourself and just yell grab my attention and we can discuss stuff as we go. Cool, so I'll be talking about some work that I've been doing on the structural controls and timing of mineralization in the far southeast corner of California. And this is work I've been doing together with Amy Moser, Ariel Borsuk and Professor Alan Rooney. So it's a couple of different universities, a couple of different fields of geology all coming together here. So firstly, let me refresh everyone about the geological setting here in California. I'm sure it's familiar to most of you, but it can't hurt. So this region has been tectonically uh, interesting for quite some time. The events that affect our story start with the Jurassic to Cretaceous magmatic arc, which is shown in this geological map by the rocks in the red. And that was related to eastward subduction of an oceanic plate. Then in the late Cretaceous, the subduction angle actually decreased. That shut off the arc magmatism and it caused the major upper plates compression that we know as the Laramide orogeny. This was followed by extensional collapse of that orogenically thickened crust. And that was the Oligocene to Miocene sort of basin and range extension. And that affected much of the Cordillera, all the way from Canada down to Mexico, even though it's most famous in the basin and range here. And then finally, as if this wasn't all enough abuse, the oceanic spreading center, part of that oceanic plate that was subducted, the spreading center itself was subducted. And that triggered the switch from a subduction setting to a transform margin. And that's what is ongoing today with the dextral strike slip San Andreas and related faults, which actually run, I hope everyone can see my cursor, cool. from down here with a big bend and then goes off up the coast here. And for this study, we'll be focusing on that little red blob in the far southeast corner of California, the Cargo Muchacho Mountains. And just for comparison, the famous mother load deposits are up here on the western side of Sierra Nevada. But we're talking about a slightly less well-known cousin of theirs. So now we've zoomed in. This mountain range that you see here is that little red blob we had on the previous slide, the Cargo Muchacho Mountains. And this area actually boasts quite a number of gold deposits, many of which have previously been mined. And one of them, Mesquite up in the top left, is still actively being mined. It's a nice big open pit. And there's also a flurry of exploration activity up near the northern part here and down here around the Oro Cruz deposit. However, the weird thing about this area is that depending on what literature you read, just about every deposit has been attributed to a different tectonic event. So we can't just come in and apply some you know, general model for all the gold in the area. For example, early work suggested that the American Girl and Madre Padre deposits, so down here, were actually formed during magmatic activity during the Jurassic. So magmatic fluids released by these arc plutons. However, later work at American Girl showed that it actually might have formed during the late Cretaceous, so millions of years later during laramide-related thrusting. However, work at Picacho, off to the east on the side, showed that it is hosted by a low angle detachment fault, which formed during the even later extension. And just to top it all off, at Mesquite, up at the top left, 
Their gold is hosted by steep dextral strike slip faults that are likely related to the San Andreas, which is even younger. So as you can see, we've got a whole range of different deposit styles to choose from. Um, so here I've just got a summary of these deposit styles. So we could have a Jurassic intrusion related gold, like the models suggested for American gold. We could have a Cretaceous laramide thrust hosted orogenic gold deposit, like people have suggested for American girl and for the Caborca orogenic gold belt, which extends down into Mexico. It could be a detachment hosted epithermal deposit, like people have suggested for Picacho or Copperstone. And it could be a transform post fault hosted epithermal deposit, like people have suggested for Mesquite. So, so many options. Why do we care? Well, a quick overview of the character of each of these deposits and importantly, what this means for exploring for them because knowing what your deposit is, is really important for trying to find more of them. Firstly, if we've got an intrusion related deposit, that the name says it, is closely associated with a parent intrusion. You'll often have, let's say an intrusion like this pink one here, and you'll often have metal zoning away from that intrusion with proximal copper. But as you go further away, you'll get base metals like lead, zinc, silver, and such. And if you're exploring for one of these, you're going to start by looking for causative intrusions. You want an area with a whole lot of magmatic activity. Then once you find some of those, you'll have a look for chemical or structural traps around those plutons. For example, in this picture, we've got a band of carbonate. So those fluids coming off of our magmatic intrusion can then get trapped by reacting with the carbonate and form a deposit. Or we've got a fault nearby. So those fluids will get trapped and precipitate their metals in the fault. Another key point with these is those metal zonations I mentioned. So if you're exploring for gold and you stumble across some veins and all they have in them is lead, yeah, that, that's sad. But if you're in that kind of area where there could be magmatic associated deposits, you know that that lead might mean that there's gold nearby. You just have to figure out which direction to go look. And finally, these deposits are associated with a whole variety of different elements. You'll have bismuth and tellurium and tungsten and antimony and all sorts of things, which means that if you're starting out your exploration program with a geochemical survey, you've got a wide range of pathfinder elements to choose from. Then the second option that we had was that these deposits are orogenic gold deposits formed during the Laramide. Now, orogenic deposits are typically found in deformed and metamorphosed terrains, and they usually form kind of just after the peak of metamorphism during the waning stages of orogeny and deformation. And they can form sort of over a wide depth range in the crust, anywhere from 20 kilometers depth up to about three kilometers. But most of them form around 1015 near the brittle ductile transition. The key thing with these is that they are structurally hosted deposits, often with your gold sitting in quartz veins, but also sometimes as disseminated or replacement gold. But they're spatially associated with sort of second order, smaller scale, low displacement faults that are somewhere near to a big first order crustal fault. And unlike the epithermal and the intrusion related deposits, they usually have very limited hydrothermal alteration and quite a simple mineral assemblage. So when you're exploring for these, you're going to be looking for big structures with little structures next to them. Structures must be of a specific age and character, preferably something around the brittle ductile transition. And uh, you can use geochemistry, but you've got a much smaller suite of elements that you can choose from that are going to be useful. Then our third option was that, well, our third and fourth option was that the deposits are epithermal, hosted in sort of brittle faults. And this is basically a variation on the intrusion related theme, except that in this case, the intrusion is somewhere below it at depth. The magmatic fluids are expelled from the intrusion rise up and precipitate in the really shallow part of the crust, so the upper kilometer and a half or so. And they can be associated with subsurface boiling, hot springs. And like the other intrusion related um, deposits, you have a whole suite of funky associated elements. So during your exploration, you've got a whole bunch of pathfinder elements for geochemistry. You also have really well studied zoned alteration assemblages for the typical argillic and propylitic and those types of alteration. If you find one, you can use the inspector towards your ore. And another key thing with exploring for these is that you want an area with a specific shallow crustal level exposed. If you're looking at the deep crust, you're probably not going to find these because they've been eroded away. 
So as you can see, knowing the type of deposit that you're looking for plays a huge role in planning your exploration strategy. And when you have an area like the southeast corner of California, where it could be any model, it's quite hard to plan ahead. So to try and tangle this, we focused on one of the less studied but beautifully exposed examples, the Oro Cruz deposit, to try see if we can actually put the story straight. So we've now zoomed in again on that little red blob we saw on the California map. And these are the Cargo Muchacho Mountains. And they are made up predominantly of Jurassic magmatic arc material. That includes the volcanic clastic Tunco formation, shown here in blue-gray. And you can see this field photo on the left. It's pretty much a massive gray nice. It's not anything to get too excited about. Fairly standard nice. This was intruded by slightly younger, but still Jurassic plutons, which are shown on the map in orange, purple, and pink. And we've got a photograph on the left here, bottom left, is a piece of the Gold Rock Ranch granite, which is this pink unit over here. And those are the two units that we most care about for the study, because Oro Cruz, the deposit I care about, is right here, hosted by the Tumco, right next to the granite. Here we've got an updated geological map from our study, which shows, there we go, Gold Rock Ranch granite, which includes the blue Tumco. Everything's now been metamorphosed to amphibolite facies, so the Tumco is now nice, the granite is a granitic nice. There's quite a strong foliation that kind of affects every unit in the Cargo Machacha Mountains, but it is kind of stronger in some places, weaker in others. In general, as you can see from these dip, um, dip and dip direction symbols, in general, the foliation is kind of gently south to southwest dipping. But just in the area of our deposit over here, it kind of curves around to actually dip eastwards, right next to this granite. And we actually interpret this as Whenever you form this foliation, the granite acted as a big competent blob and the foliation had to bend around it to form. So this is now a view of the Oro Cruz open pit where we did a lot of our observations. And this was just because it is beautifully exposed. Like I said, it's hosted purely in the Tumco formation, but it's a highly foliated part of the Tumco with a lot of metasomatic alteration and a lot of pegmatites, as you can see here. So now we're going to have a closer look at that inactive Oro Cruz open pit. So this is a kind of semi-aerial view looking down to the southeast, and that's kind of in this area, down dip of the main foliation. Key features visible in the pit are the strong ductile foliation, which is parallel to this dark blue band that I've drawn in. We've also got this white dashed line, which shows a low angle brittle fault, dipping down parallel to this foliation. So dipping down to the southeast. We also have a bunch of other high angle brittle faults shown in these white lines, but they don't have much displacement that we can see and they don't really seem to be associated with gold. So we're leaving them for now. You'll also notice the different colors here. We've got red, which is showing patches of red iron oxide staining, which are kind of scattered all over the place, but are especially intense along this low angle brittle fault of ours. And then finally, we've got these zones of blue-green staining, which is where we have malachite and chrysocolla. And these are the ones that have historically been associated with gold mineralization. Okay, here we've got same model, but now we're just looking kind of west. So it's basically a cross-sectional view with, that the pit wall provides, which is really nice. And again, we can see that low angle bristle fault dipping gently to the left, the southeast, parallel to the main ductile foliation, all of that red iron oxide staining associated with it. And then these zones of blue, sort of copper rich staining that are also kind of parallel to this foliation. One of the things you can see nicely here are these abundant pegmatites, all of this pale color here, all of those are pegmatites. It's just shot through. It's quite spectacular in the field actually. So it's all fine and well, but where is the gold? <laughs> so we did what any exploration geo does at the beginning and analyzed everything we could find. Through, through whole rock chemistry, it representative examples of everything. And as you can see, we mostly found gold in the really oxidized, either red or blue stained areas, with the best grades over here associated with the really iron rich oxidized stuff along that low angle bristle fault. 
here, we're just looking at the other pit wall, so everything's just kind of turned around. And once again, you can see we get some quite spectacular grades here. I must just note that these are just scattered random grab sample grades, so don't use them as indications of the resource grades or anything like that. But they give an example of what you can see in the pits. So here we're looking at some examples of what that bright oxidized material actually looks like. You can see we've got the red, orange, yellow iron oxide staining. The blue is mostly chrysocolla. Green is malachite, so those contain copper. At the top right, this is actually a photo from the underground workings. That same low angle bristle fault from the pits is actually running right through this photo over here. But you can barely see it because it's just a complete mess of red, rusty iron oxides. And you've got these little kind of scarlet blobs in the white area. And those ones are actually some really well-formed cubic, yeah, cubic shapes of iron oxide, which we interpret as oxidized pseudomorphs after pyrite, because it's the same cubic shape as pyrite. So here we're going to take a closer look at, this is the same area that we see underground, low angle brittle fault coming through, lots of red oxidation. And sample over here, nice, 9 ppm gold. And the sample of it there, right next to it, is this one that we can see a close-up of. And here you can actually see those little pseudomorphs of pyrite. If we take a closer look at those under the microscope now, you can see this image here. So this is a corner of that cubic pseudomorph. And we've actually got visible gold sitting in these things. So it looks like the gold really is associated with this really rusty oxide stuff along the vault. This association is actually confirmed by ChemScan phase mapping, which we did at the Colorado School of Mines. So on the left, we've got a photomicrograph of an entire thin section, and the iron oxides are showing up as this dark area. Next to that is a backscatter electron image, and you can see the kind of paler grays, those same iron oxides, and you can see all the pics of gold that we found, so it's definitely associated with the iron. And then on the far right is the ChemScan phase map, which is of a little patch here of this iron rich area. And the phase map shows that, yep, we've got in dark blue iron oxides, and in green, we've got iron bearing clays. So, yep, it's iron oxide and iron altered stuff that we're dealing with. This is just another example. This one has less iron oxides in it, but you can see these nice cubically shaped um, pyrite pseudomorphs there, shows up really nicely over there. So, what do we know about these brittle faults? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the main brittle fault, which is exposed in the pits, is this low angle structure, kind of parallel to the high temperature shear foliation. And in this case, with a bit of a top to the north thrust sense displacement. So these two pictures actually kind of join up. Got quite a tall geologist at the bottom left for scale. And you can see that on the far right, we've displaced one of these big fat pegmatites. And there's also a skinny little folded pegmatite further right with a beautiful top to the right thrust sense displacement. Um, we have found other brittle faults outside of the pits that have a similar orientation, but that actually seem to have a top down to the south normal sense displacement. So the brittle faults are messy and there are a variety of them. So something I'd really want to know is when did these brittle faults form? Well, we didn't actually get a direct age for any of them, sadly but we did get an apatite cooling age from the nearby rocks. So apatite's a really cool mineral in that it incorporates uranium, which then decays to lead. And by measuring the proportions of uranium and lead, we can get an age. And that's what we've got here. It's various isotopes of uranium and lead plotted against one another. Cool. But above a certain temperature, lead will actually diffuse out of the apatite crystal, resetting its age. So the age you get when you analyze uranium, lead, and apatite actually reflects when it cooled through this closure temperature. And for appetites, the size of our grains, this closure temperature is about 450 to 530 degrees Celsius. We got an age of about 61 million years. So this just shows us that at 61, these rocks cooled to below about 450, 530 degrees Celsius. How does that help us to date these really cool brittle faults and their associated oxidation gold? Well, quartz, which is the main rock forming mineral in many of these, it only becomes brittle at temperatures below like 250, 300 Celsius. So these brittle faults must have formed at some time after cooling below the appetite closure temperature. 
So we know they formed sometime after 61 million years. Cool. So this whole association of gold with low angle brittle faults, the supergene oxidized low temperature iron oxide type material and a tertiary age, so younger than 61 million years. This sounds a lot like the nearby deposits of epithermal detachment hosted stuff, such as Picacho and Copperstone. So case closed. We're going to go do exploration for low temperature epithermal gold. But we don't really have any of the funky elements that you'd expect in an epithermal. Wait, is this the whole story? So if we go back to the assays that we did and we look along this main brittle fault, sure, that's where we get the highest gold grades, but it's not the only place we find gold. These diffuse areas with a bit of blue copper staining, they also have some decent gold grades in them. If we have a look at the rocks from that area, here's a slice through one of them. We realize that that kind of blue green crystal malachite staining is actually just a little bit on the surface and the rock itself is mostly fresh. And here you can actually see fresh unoxidized pyrite sitting here, 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 that's closely associated with these really deformed quartz and magnetite veins. Often they're quartz veins, you can see the kind of pale color here with magnetites just along the rims, giving it the dark outline. And they're really deformed. They're parallel to the foliation or they're highly folded like these ones. They're then cross cut by all those pegmatites that we saw, which is pretty cool. And if we take a close look at some of this pyrite, if you're really lucky, you can actually see visible gold in it. So we know there's definitely pyrite sitting with these as well. Here again, you can see those folded quartz magnetite veins in this plain polarized thin section photo. A lot of the finer dark bits are magnetite in these. A lot of the coarse angular bits are pyrite and chalcopyrite. Once again, right in those sulfides is where we are getting our gold spots. In this case, it seems to mostly be electron. And if we look at the phase map, this big yellow block is pyrite. And we've actually, in this case, got gold sitting in fractures within the pyrite and as tiny little blobs. So cool, we've got gold now sitting with fresh sulfides. What do we know about them and their timing relationships and how they formed? Well, as we've seen, they're closely associated with these highly folded magnetite quartz veins. So they're cut by the pegmatites. And if we look in this section, the pyrite actually maybe is overgrowing magnetite. Difficult as to how to exactly interpret relationships like this. It could mean that the pyrite and the magnetite were precipitated at the same time by the same hydrothermal fluids. Or it could mean that the pyrite and the gold came later and were just preferentially precipitated where the gold fluids reacted with magnetite. So we've kind of got two options there that we'll keep in mind for later. Here again, trying to figure out now where these magnetite quartz veins fit into the deformation and the history and everything. You can see that they're highly folded, either folded like this or parallel to the foliation. So we interpret these as being synchronous with the formation of this ductal foliation. We also know that they predate the pegmatites. We also have epidote alteration, which is kind of in the areas a little bit more distal from the main mineralized zones. And you can see we've got beautiful bright green epidote. We'll also have darker green hornblende, this reddish orange kelsic garnet, a bit of quartz, a bit of calcite. And this is sometimes associated with the magnetite. So we reckon this and the magnetite were probably related to the same hydrothermal system. And again, based on field relationships, we can see that it formed during ductile deformation. You can see here, it's beautifully smeared out by that ductile deformation, but it occurred before the pegmatite because it's beautifully cross cut over there. So I keep noting that these hydrothermal assemblages formed during ductile deformation. So what can we tell about the ductile deformation itself? Well, as we saw in that structural map right at the beginning, the ductile foliation is actually developed in the Tumco and the granite. It's basically developed in all the rocks in the area, but it's much stronger in the Tumco. Here, this is all Tumco formation nice in the background. And you can see it generally has this overall left dipping um, form and that's that ductile foliation. We're standing on granite, which uh, it's got a bit of a foliation to it, but it's mostly pretty blocky. There are a lot of areas that look barely deformed, but, but they are just gently. If we have a closer look at that ductile foliation, we can see that 
it was definitely ductile, high temperature, probably about amphibolite capacity deformation. They are rare, but we do see occasional shear sense indicators like this little feldspar class showing top to the north. And here we actually have a chunk of epidote that is asymmetric and is also showing top to the north thrusting. And we went and had a look at the contact between the Tumco gneiss and the granite. And that looks like a tectonic contact as well. So that granite was actually thrust on top of the Tumco formation. If we look at the microstructure of this foliation, it's associated with high temperature quartz microstructures. Here you can see these really amoeboid quartz grains, which shows that we had kind of unrestrained grain boundary migration. And that typically occurs at temperatures of about 500 degrees Celsius. So this is pretty, pretty warm deformation going on. And finally, within this high temperature thrust foliation in the parts of the granite that are nicely folded, we have titanite. And here in this top photo micrograph, you can actually see a beautiful euhedral titanite crystal, which we interpret as magmatic. That just formed when the granite formed. However, we also get titanite that looks like this. It's really messed up. These kind of granular aggregates of what we think are recrystallized titanite, dynamically recrystallized. Amy Moser went and dated some of this titanite by uranium lead, and we get a whole range of different ages shown in the plot here. You can see that we've got a couple of ages up here, about 140 million years. We interpret those as belonging to these euhedral titanites and reflecting the magmatic age of when this granite formed. However, most of the ages are here around 65 million years, and those belong to the recrystallized titanites. And we interpret those as being the age of titanite recrystallization, which is probably the age of ductile deformation. So that's really cool. With Amy's work, we've been able to directly date the ductile thrusting in this area. Now we're going to take a quick look at those spectacular pegmatites. So as we can see in all of these pictures, actually, they cross cut the ductile foliation. But those that are sub parallel, like in the left photos, are boudinaged, so they've been extended, while those at high angles, like in the right photo, are folded, so they've been compressed. So this, plus their microstructures, they've got nicely deformed quartz, suggest that they were in place during at least the later stages of deformation. They cross-cut most of the foliation, but they were affected by some deformation, so late stages of the deformation. And the structure of the pegmatites with low angle ones that are brudenaged and high angle ones that are folded, let us actually reconstruct the strain ellipse shown on the left here. And this shows that, yep, this could actually form during top to the north directed thrusting. Then Ariel Borsuk, one of my other collaborators, dated a whole bunch of these pegmatites by zircon uranium lead analysis and found it, you guessed it, late Cretaceous age of about 63 to 66 million years. So now we're feeling pretty confident. We've actually got this major ductile thrusting at about 65 million years. Now it's associated with the hydrothermal alteration, pegmatites, and maybe with the gold. Well, we're not sure. Remember this picture that I showed earlier? Shows that the pyrite might have formed at the same time as magnetite, or it might have formed later, maybe even much later, maybe during brittle faulting, and it just went and sat on the magnetite. One way to check this is to date the sulfides directly, which we can do by a really cool method of analyzing the rhenium and the osmium content of the sulfides. And this I did together with Professor Alan Rooney up at Yale. And I have to just show this video because I'm a field and structural geologist and I don't often get to play with lab stuff. Oh, bother. Anyway, it was very exciting getting to play with the lab, lab equipment and wet chemistry. And this little video actually just shows chunks of my sulfides boiling in acid, which is quite cool. And the rhenium osmium data gives an age of, surprise, surprise, 65 million years. So it looks like the sulfides really did come in with all very close to the magnetites and all the rest of that drama. So now we've got a second story. We have gold with fresh sulfides hosted by a high temperature ductile thrust sense shear zone, and it was deposited during the late Cretaceous. So this sounds a lot like the Laramide age thrust host, thrust hosted orogenic gold deposits of the Kabor Orogenic Gold Belt. 
and that second model that they had for the American girl deposit. Great, so which one is it? Well, we're gonna quickly review all the data that we have for the Oro Cruz area and the kind of geological history that we can put together. We start off with this blue Tumco formation nice. That was intruded sometime in the Jurassic by the pink granite. However, much later during the late Cretaceous at about 65 million years, we have all that chaos breaking loose. This whole package is deformed in a broad ductile thrust sense shear zone with top to the north. So in this picture, top to the left motion. This deformation happened at about 500 degrees and we've dated it using the recrystallized titanite at about 65, 66 million years. During this deformation, we had hydrothermal fluids which invaded parts of the shear zone, structural complexities, bends next to the competent granite, and created the epidote alteration, the magnetite quartz veins, and the gold mineralization. And we dated that with rhenium osmium at 65 million years. And then slightly later, but still during the ductile thrusting, and in terms of our geochronology overlapping in terms of the errors, we had the pegmatites shown in the dark pink, which intruded the shear zone, and they give an age of 63 to 66 million years. Then a few million years later, after all this drama has calmed down, the whole area has cooled to below 450, 500 degrees based on the appetite cooling age we have. And then sometime after that, we're not too sure how long, it was cut by brittle faults, such as this dashed black line. Low temperature fluids moved along those faults, overprinting, oxidizing the gold and sulfide mineralization and created the spectacular red and blue staining that we see now and we associated with, associate with the ore now. We can also summarize this in a timeline. So starting with the Jurassic on the left, the host rock, the gold rock ranch granite, then in the Cretaceous, all of that drama with the deformation and hydrothermal fluids, and then sometime later, the brittle faulting. And our model is that the gold came in over here with the sulfides, but that later the gold was remobilized or upgraded when that shear zone was reactivated by a brittle fault and the sulfides were oxidized. Now, one key thing that we're not sure of is, is all the gold, the high grade gold associated with the oxides, is all of that originally from this laramide gold or did extra gold come in at that point? So unfortunately, we're not sure. What does this mean for that ridiculous number of models we saw? Well, Oro Cruz, at least, was definitely not formed by magmatic fluids during the Jurassic. Instead, we have several lines of evidence that place it firmly during the late Cretaceous as a thrust-hosted orogenic gold deposit formed during the Laramide orogeny. But it did undergo structural reactivation and alteration during these later brittle events. And that gave it an overprint that looks an awful lot like these epithermal models. If we zoom out a little bit, and here we have a map showing uh, the southeast corner of California, Arizona over here, and the Sonora region of Mexico down here. This work of ours supports the inclusion of Oro Cruz, which sits over there, in the Caborca origin at Gold Belt, which, as I mentioned earlier, is this belt of Laramide age thrust-hosted orogenic gold deposits that stretch all the way down into Sonora. And that belt actually includes the La Herradura mine down across the border. And they have reserves of over 6 million ounces of gold. So there's some juicy stuff in this belt. However, this work also suggests that some of the detachments or transform fault-hosted deposits that we see up here, especially in Arizona, suggests that they might actually also be Laramide orogenic deposits just ones that were more thoroughly overprinted during the later lower temperature events. And finally, what does all of this mean for exploration? Well, if you want to find gold deposits in this area, first thing you want to look for are structures or areas that were deformed during the Laramide thrusting. Once you've found that, you want to look for structural complexities, local extensional zones within these shear zones, maybe where you have bends around a big fat granite, maybe where you have a releasing bend in a shear zone. You can also use the associated hydrothermal alteration. We saw that this gold is associated with magnetite quartz veins, which means that Aeromag is maybe a really useful tool for finding it. However, if you want to find what might be even better targets, 
higher grade oxide deposits. You need to look for where these structures have been overprinted or reactivated by later brittle events. And that's where we'll form these higher grade oxide deposits. And in that case, you can also look for destruction of magnetism with your AeroMag survey, or you can look for signs of that supergene oxidation, the really brightly colored oxides. With that, I just want to thank the various funding agencies and research institutes that made this work possible. Um, we were supported by a very wide range of funding and people and all sorts of things, including the Geological Society of America, the NSF, the AGES program, as well as several different universities. I also want to thank Southern Empire Resources and Lincoln Mining for kindly allowing us access to the mine and to all sorts of historical data. And then huge thanks to all the people who have helped me in the field with the various analytical things and also just with really useful discussions. And with that, I'll say thank you and take any questions as long as they're not too hard. So, Taryn, some of those uh, pyrite pseudomorphs you were pointed at in your thin sections looked a little wedge-shaped. Is, is there a possibility some of it was arsenopyrite rather than that's, pyrite? That's have, a really good point, and absolutely it might be. And do um, you have any arsenic, arsenic chemistry on the rocks? I need to dig up my analyses. So, unfortunately, we didn't do any um, pyrite chemistry. So the, for the, all we know, there might be quite a lot of arsenic in the pyrite. In terms of the whole rock, historical whole rock assays, I don't remember py, um, arsenic being particularly notable, um, but there might be a small component of arsenopyrite in there. Yeah, okay. Thanks. So if you go a little farther uh, northwest to the... Uh, Santa Rosa Mountains, mm -hmm. the Modoc hot spring deposit, which is very young. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. It's on Indian land, on tribal lands. Um, but it's also associated with uh, Jurassic quartz monzonite. And I'm, I think I remember mm -hmm. it, was, it was Dick Tosdall saying that every, anywhere you found Jurassic monzonite in, yeah. in that area, you'd find gold. But I think that's another example of probably that age of mineralization that's now been remineralized, remobilized, as you're, mm -hmm. as you're noting, along these young, you know, brittle faults associated, in some cases with the San Andreas fault system. Absolutely. Uh, so that might extend that kind of, your kind of model up even farther, you know, to, be... to the Northwest. Yeah. I'd be intrigued to look that up. I haven't heard of the Modoc deposits, so I'll need to you need to do some Googling on that. I'll send you the references. They're pretty obscure, but my student worked on that deposit. So, uh, oh, thanks. Yeah. Is there much in the way of underground workings throughout the area? And, you know, if so, were there a higher grade that people were finding? Or Absolutely. Um, the Oro Cruz deposit itself actually has that inactive open pit where I did most of my work but there is an underground portion of that. And that was specifically to target the higher grade oxidized portion of the deposits. And then in the next door mine, which is the American girl deposits, they also had, I think two or three separate underground sections, mostly targeting higher grade portions as well. So yeah, yeah. Did you have access to um, the and I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, it's Bill Halliger. Did you have access to, uh, uh, to assays from the mine? And uh, if so, were you able to put together a uh, kind of a, a three-dimensional reconstruction of the distribution? Because if they turned it into an open pit, then it would suggest that that broader scale mineralization was worth going after. And it isn't just the epithermal that was, was, was driving things. So that remobilization mm -hmm. event was nice for, for upgrading portions of the mine, but, but uh, there, must have been, uh, there must have been enough there to justify uh, open cut. Absolutely. And just from the kind of scatter grab samples we did in the pit where you're getting up to 14 ppm gold, still in the pits accessible. 
um, yeah, there, there totally is still viable material in the pits. I believe it actually closed in the 80s with the big gold price crash then. So at modern prices, it would be decent. Um, however, Southern Empire Resources are currently looking at this and they're actually looking with focus on the underground. So they have put together the resource um, 3D grade distributions and everything. One problem we have is, sorry, there is a whole lot of historical assay data, but it doesn't have any associated rock type data with it. So we just have numbers for gold. So we can plot the distribution of grade and I can kind of line it up and say, you know, oh, my, my mapped fault on surface projects down to kind of where that high grade gold is. But we have no idea if it was associated with oxidized material or sheared quartz veins or anything, which is really frustrating. Okay. Darren Todd's asking to be unmuted on his phone. He can't, oh. he can't unmute himself. Let me try track him down and ah, oh, that's probably this one. That is very strange. Apparently, I also only have the option to ask him to unmute. Um, so I think we've got some problem with the, being a phone. Cool. Todd, I do apologize. Unfortunately, I can't give you a voice at the moment. And then Dinah's got a question in chat. Okay. Yes. Um, if, yeah, if anyone else has questions in the meantime, I will. Oh, did you hear me, oh, Karen? Yes, I can. Wonderful. Oh. So. You kept saying hit star six to unmute. I did that about three times. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was probably okay. exactly as I was trying to push buttons on my side. Yes. Uh, okay, good. Well, very good. Uh, interesting presentation. I'm glad uh, I was finally able to, uh, to hear it. I, I had to exit and then go to my phone in order to hear you and I could see the screen. So everything worked out great. Okay, um, glad it worked. But you know, if, if uh, I know Mike McKibben knows a lot about the salt and sea. Uh, in fact, mm -hmm. Mike, I just read your salt and sea lithium resource chapter right before this, Ooh. so I'll be fresh in my mind. But, uh, you know, quite some time ago, uh, Molly Corp, we did have a salt and sea uh, gold exploration program and things. And I think it, you know, if you if you look at the trend that you've shown there, particularly in the northern part there, that yeah. that pretty much follows the, uh, the fossil part of the. Uh, it's it's kind of up for debate exactly where the uh, San Andreas Fault uh, mm -hmm. extends once you get into the geothermal area where it seems to sidestep, and where you see the sidesteps, you see a geothermal system, and mm -hmm. then it kind of works its way down, uh, we thought, uh, uh, right about where the northern extent of your, probably about where your uh, the gold deposits that you studied right there, and then probably extended, we thought, into the, you know, the Gulf of California. And we did do a lot of aeromag, mag, by the way, uh, back oh. in the old days, looking uh, at aeromagnetic data. Among, and a lot of, uh, we had pretty sophisticated uh, remote sensing capabilities. So we did do a lot of mapping and things using uh, remote sensing. So um, I actually, at that time, we thought that a lot of the gold mineralization probably was reactivated. I think, Mike, even on a field trip, I think I was with you. I think I might have mentioned that to you yeah, yeah. about the, the gold being remobilized. So it's kind of interesting to see more of the That's proof cool. than we had. I thought your, uh, uh, your analysis and the types of work that you integrated was very nicely done to constrain the uh, the ages, which we didn't have. But um, I think there's probably a lot of potential further north because it's buried. A lot of that's buried. So mm -hmm. you have to use, you know, geophysical methods to hone in on areas to be uh, to be explored. So the kind of the surface expression and those phenomenal uh, outcrops that you had to look at uh, are, are great to study in the way you did because it gives you some inclination as to what you should be looking for and what kind of signatures might you expect from that style of mineralization. So I thought you did a very nice job. So I'm confident, I know you said earlier that you're not going to get much sleep to finish up your degree, but <laughs> I'm pretty confident you've got more than enough here to pull that together for your dissertation, which 
for those that didn't know, I think you're going to be finishing that in May at USC, correct? Yep, that I will. So, uh, as you mentioned, not much sleep and probably lots of chocolates, but uh, it'll get there. Um, very interesting what you're saying with the salt and sea area as well. Um, so I've just pulled up this early map that we have. And yeah, yep. like you were saying, with the that portion of the San Andreas gets very messy and it's undercover. All we know here is yeah. that it's somewhere, somewhere within this dune field. So exactly where yeah. the rocks are buried and you can't see anything. It's it's in there somewhere. Right. Um, so yeah, well, really close by. And that's where the geophysics really comes in handy. <laughs> yeah, so under, yeah. under the Santa Rosa's on the other side of the, the trough, uh, I think, yeah. I think like, Kennecott or Homestake, I forget, did some arrow mag under the Santa yeah. Rosa's and there's a pretty strong anomaly under there, yeah. they were arguing was it maybe a porphyry kind of yeah. signature. Ooh. But then there's there's a whole chain yeah, of actually, hot spring deposits that that run yeah. even south of Modoc. So, well, the earthquake well, epicenters are, are good at outlining those faults in that uh, area beneath the dunes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, you're right, Mike. There, there's. Uh, I, we like I said, we had access to a lot of aeromag data, and there's a huge magnetic anomaly over in Santa Rosa Mountains. But of course, that's all a uh, wilderness area, so yeah. I think that was pretty, uh, pretty good exploration territory. Just as to the north of you, where the naval, I think it's all off, just north of Mesquite is the bombing range. Yeah. <laughs> which, from yeah. perspective, no one's going to be going in there for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Even this section sort of directly east, a lot of this area is military as well. So lying in your tent at Oro Cruz, you kind of get the jets doing nighttime flybys. And it's not quite wilderness feeling. You, you know, it, I was interested in the, the importance of the detachment faults because I know Bob, I'm speaking to Bob Hickman, I know that detachment gold, I believe Molly Corp and maybe you and Bob Varga took a look at that detachment gold scenario and it looks like they do play a pretty important role those mm -hmm. low angle detachment faults well yeah they, they Which, certainly do further to the north yeah yeah and i never understood and now what do you think taryn the source of the fluids mm -hmm. i know we talked about reactivation along those uh, mm -hmm. low angle brittle faults but what might you think the source of the fluids might be for that <laughs> Two. So that's the, uh, yeah, Let, let's go into uncharted territory here. Um, my thoughts would be it could be, um, yeah, if you've got low angle attachments and you're sitting up near the surface where you're affecting your ore, um, anything oxidizing would break down your sulfides and release the gold and allow it to then move wherever it needs to move. So I'd imagine even just straight meteoric water could do that. Um, I don't know the geochemistry of it. I haven't looked into that. Um, but I can imagine that you don't need much in the way of exotic fluids unless you're bringing in more gold. So it all depends on whether all the gold in the detachments is remobilized from somewhere else, or if we're actually bringing in additional gold, then we'd need some magmatic fluids, but who knows where they come from. Um, Maybe mistaken, but um, at least for like the pyrite hosted gold, Mm -hmm. uh, can't you look at the osmium ratios? I think it's 187, 186 ratio to determine source. Yeah. That's a good point. And it's data that I have, and I just haven't yet done the literature dive to kind of find what ratios to expect for different types. Um, yeah, that, that would be really useful. Another thing that we really want to do here, but it just scope wise got away from us is fluid inclusion work. Um, just to get an idea of pressure temperature formation and maybe pressure temperature of the reactivation and whatever fluids were involved there. Um, and we do have fluid inclusions. And if anyone knows someone who wants to do a study, there's a great study, but it's its own whole study. So. A little yeah, late for you to add that to your repertoire for your dissertation, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I took one look at a few thin sections and I was like, oh, we've got you know six different fluid inclusion assemblages and half of them are overprinted and this looks like I don't have time for it right now. Yeah, that, that's a dissertation in itself, fluid inclusion. Yeah. Yeah. 
do you do you think it's Bill Holliger again? Do you think there are implications here for beyond the uh, beyond the yellow belt that you showed in your um, in one of your last diagrams, for example, mother load? I think the implications could just be maybe not region specific, but just for gold deposits in general. Looking the just the whole importance of looking at places that have been affected by multiple episodes of deformation, potential remobilization, has the like chance to really upgrade your deposits. So I'd say any gold area in the world that's been redeformed has the chance for higher grades. Um, Well, thanks for a really Karen. interesting talk. Yeah, it's been, it, and Karen, you. before I forget, uh, mm -hmm. what are your plans after graduation? Um, up in the air at this moment. <laughs> Sleep okay. for about those three days solid. Gotta... Maybe, a, well, you know, but for those of you who don't know, and uh, because unfortunately, I apologize for not being able to do the, the audio early on, but Taryn did work on an interesting metamorphose set X deposit in South Africa, where she's from. And so she comes to USC with um, exploration and, and work experience. And I'm assuming that you came to USC to get your PhD and then go into a, more of an academic or research career. Probably, yes. But if I can do some consulting and work like that on the side, um... Yeah, as a lot of people who work with me know, I really enjoy being able to take the deep dive into the interesting questions, which you often can't do in industry. But if you can then do that on questions that also have practical implications, even better. So like this project where it's really interesting research, but hopefully will also be useful to someone. Um, yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll be kind of straddling the fence for a long time still. Well, I think the fact that you teased out the age dating of all the different events is really impressive and that that's what what was needed to to look at this and i'm really Im impressed for the way you did that thank you uh, I think, karen, uh, can I, karen can i just sneak one last question in here at the end um, sure so you had the open pit to study hmm. and i know that you throughout your presentation which was i thought very very good um, you integrated a number of um, observational elements um, into, you know, what you might look for for the gold mineralization. But could you, could you just do a quick, just bullet review of what the key surface expressions might surface expressions might be if this deposit were underlying, you know, pristine, non-explored terrain? Gotcha. No, sure thing. Um, yeah. So if it was exposed on surface and so not under overburden, then it would probably have already been spotted by prospectors ages ago because you've got that really bright colored in your face supergene oxidation. So really bright reds, really bright blues and greens for your malachite and chrysocola. So it would have been quite visible on surface. If it hadn't been oxidized, you would have looked for those really little deformed magnetite quartz veins and highly sheared areas. So you want high strain zones. Um, so those are probably the most visible things. And then in terms of geophysical expression, it's um, magnetized regions, again, with those magnetite quartz veins that are associated with it. And then maybe even higher grades where you have a magnetized region with part of it that's been demagnetized by later brittle faulting and oxidation. So I, I think Aramag would be a really key thing here. Um, I, th I think the image shows real clearly that, you know, maybe 10% is bedrock exposed and there's an awful lot of alluvium there. They, and there is an exploration company up in this area that's actually working, looking at the stuff sort of between Mesquite and Picacho, all under the surface here. And they've apparently had quite a lot of success with IP, but I'm not sure what it is that's actually giving the IP signature, if it's fault related rocks or if it's alteration or what. Well, Alan, is that uh, is, uh, the um, we had a talk on the uh, Imperial Gold project? Oh, yes, that one. I don't, 
know if Mark had a chance to be on. I can't really tell who all's on here, but yeah, no, Mark. Uh, Mark or Duke is not on the call. I don't believe. Ah, uh, okay. And can you point out where that is, Taryn? Do you know where mm -hmm. the with respect to where you've been working? Yeah, so that's that's actually the company that I was just talking about. That's under these thought, areas over here. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought because they they have been exploring. I remember in Mark's talk in some of the uh, covered terrain there, mm -hmm. and I think some success. And their one of their comments was, if we have all this alluvium, we're going to have to remove. What can we do with the uh, uh, the aggregate? So, yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot of potential. Yeah. So the kind of work you did, I think, has a lot of application to, to others who might be looking in, in this area. <clears throat> I know a lot of people may be surprised that, that there's this much activity in California with California regulations being what they are, but the Imperial Gold Project, yeah. we were sure, is, uh, is moving forward, so it can be overcome. I do think there are a lot of people that wished all of this would just move five miles east. Um, but you know, well, we'll, just means we have to work to our highest standard. That's right. Really good in the end. That's right. So, yeah. uh, okay. Well, are there any other questions by uh, anyone else? Uh, Todd, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Jane. Jane, uh, do we hear? Uh, yep. From uh, an historic perspective, you mentioned that the surface uh, expressions were always in this uh, magnetite. Or, most of these two, three hundred year old diggings that uh, were they all identified more or less in the same way? In other words, the prospectors two, three hundred years ago, the Spaniards, all, all over Arizona, all over uh, southern Arizona, uh, down through Sonora, uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, miles of tunnels. Uh, what did they see on the surface and what were they following as they advanced? Unfortunately, those are questions I'd love to know myself. Ah, that's a good yeah. question. Yeah. Um, again, I think I'd put my money on a lot of them were following oxidation. So the supergene malachite and chrysocolla um, and probably also just quartz veining. Um, I know the historical stuff in the Oro Cruz area, actually the, the name of this mountain range, the Cargo Muchacho, apparently comes from way back in the Spanish days. There was either a group of farmers or a group of prospectors that were camping in the area. Young kids went off to play and came back with their shirts literally like piled up and full of gold nuggets that they dug out of the streams. So they named it like the Loaded Boys Cargo Muchacho Mountains. Um, so apparently a lot of them were just following visible gold. Actually, most of the old miners were looking at color. That's what they were looking at. If the gold is associated with the pyrite and copper is associated with malachite, they're looking for color. That's all they had to go on. It wasn't until we learned about tectonics and time and environments that we started looking at time rather than just rock associations. So they were looking for color. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Oh, thank I you, mean, I think your, your photo micrograph showed pretty clearly you're not that's no CM gold um, that you have in that deposit and I think that's true for most of these I don't I don't know that there was visible gold too often in any of these quartz veins or even an associated with the pyrite well it's probably from the later oxidation events that you would get that kind of material showing up Yeah, we've got one sample that I left at the office during lockdown, so I don't have a photo in here. Um, but it's one of those kind of oxidized late fracture surfaces. And there's a thin sheen of what I think is a flake of gold that's formed on there. So absolutely, I think during the late oxidation, you could kind of aggregate it into visible chunks. Yeah. Um, but the early stuff, yeah, you, you won't see that. Aaron, I have just one question is, how does it work in these times of COVID? Does USC allow you to come in to saw rocks and use equipment? And um, 
very difficultly. So for the first few months after last March, uh, it was a complete shutdown. The whole university was closed. Then probably during the late summer, I think it was, or about August maybe, they opened it up for select research. If you could show that your research had to be done on campus and as long as you could keep a certain num maximum number of people in each building and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of procedures we have to follow now if we want to go onto campus and tracking things and health checks and stuff. Um, but it is possible to get onto campus now, just not for most people, like only if you've got lab work. Um, yeah. I would say for, for me, the timing's been great because it forced me to sit in front of my computer and write. <laughs> so. Yeah, you see we're limited to 25% occupancy right now. Same, same thing. Yeah, same here. I think we might have some labs up to 50, but only small labs, apparently. I guess better than zero. So. <laughs> yeah. You say you traveled to School of Mines, though, to do lab work there, or was that done for you? The, the School of Mines work uh, was done for me. Um, so that we just sent them the samples. The Yale work I did, but luckily I did that two years ago now. Um, so that, and then also the Arizona Laser Center for the Geochronology that we did in person as well. That was also, luckily most of the lab work was two to three years ago now. So pre-COVID, very luckily. It's, pretty, it's impressive you could pull together doing uh, all that work in these diverse places. Uh, and you're fortunate you did some of this before COVID hit, that's for sure. Yeah, very, very fortunate. And also just really fortunate because a lot of the, like GSA and NSF have various smallish grants, but you can apply for quite a few of them. And that's how pretty much every analysis we did was funded by a different little grants from a different pot of money. Um, but there are enough of them that you can pull a lot together to get quite a bit of work done, which is really cool. Cool. Well, then, right. yeah. well, we'll look forward. I'm assuming you're going to publish this uh, as part of your dissertation, right? So this is a slightly embarrassing um, answer. Uh, half of this probably won't even be in my dissertation, which is on a totally different topic. Um, yeah, so my main dissertation work is actually on ductile shear zones and the more the structural yeah. side. So the geochronology part of this will be in it and will be hopefully published quite soon. But the implications for gold models and orogenic versus epithermal, that'll be a second publication, which will be one day after the dissertation. Um, okay, good. But yeah, hopefully good. not too far in the future. You should put it in economic geology. Yes. <laughs> Challenge <That's> accepted. Right. <laughs> Are you still on the editorial board, Mike? No, that's, that's, oh. that, was, that was last century. <laughs> okay. Sure. <laughs> well, Taryn, I think I want to thank you very much for taking time to do this. I know it's a hectic time. I know when we asked you to do this, we said January or February, and right away you said, I think January, because I'm going to be getting pretty busy. <laughs> so I know yeah. you're going to be busy, and I, I'm confident uh, that you're going to pull it together. Uh, this was a great presentation. I think um, you pulled together a, a lot of information and your credit, I think it's it's outstanding work. So I don't think you're gonna have any trouble finding gainful employment either. So uh, I, I, mean, I hope you'll you'll keep in touch so we will know, you know, follow your your progression. So thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you and the rest of SME for inviting me here. It's been really, really nice getting feedback and just being able to share ideas and check that they make some sense to people who know the area. So yeah, thank you all for listening. <laughs>